Hear my voice, O Lord, according to your loving kindness, according to your judgments, give me life. Amen. Now, forgive me for being a little shell-shocked heading into this morning's service after what happened last Sunday when there was no audio feed going out over local live. So um, I have my phone here because I'd asked my dear wife, please text me around 10.05 to let me know if there's any audio going out of here. Now, we had audio at that time. Then um, I've got another message um, that it was gone again, but it's back on. So at least part of the service is making its way audio-wise out of our worship space. Um, it was great when John Stratton wandered in last Sunday, like 10.35. I'm thinking, well, that's a casual arrival. And at the end of the service as I processed out, John said, I tried like four times. There was no audio. And God bless the few folks who joined in the virtual worship, uh, virtual social time, because they were pretty mellow about it. So thank you all for your patience and um, you can imagine what kind of a week Michael in particular had um, trying to sort this out. And even though he never heard a specific reason as to why the audio didn't go out, here we are on a wing and a prayer. Now, the Gospels are great for hearing the four amazing stories about the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ especially as we are called, and we heard this in, we hear this in all the Gospels, um, about ways that we ought to model what Jesus did when he was on this earth as the divine Son of God, yet in human form. But if we really want to get a serious and meaningful glimpse of what life in the early church was all about, then we should turn to the epistles that we hear between the Old Testament and the Gospel every Sunday. Today we heard a passage from Paul's epistle to the church in Philippi. This was the fourth and final passage from that epistle. So I think perhaps we ought to pause today and ask ourselves, what's up in Philippi? I think this particular epistle by Paul, and it is one of the epistles that there's essentially 100% unanimity that it was written by Paul, um, and the special relationship that he appears to have with the people of the church in Philippi should draw our attention. But first, we should also appreciate what the city of Philippi was all about. Um, for Paul, it was his first church established in Europe. He'd been over in Troas, if we can read about this in the Acts of the Apostles. And Acts does a great job of talking about activity all over the eastern Mediterranean, into Europe, all the way to Rome, about how the early church got up and running. But it doesn't get into depth like the epistles do to Rome, to the church in Corinth, to the church in Galatia, to the church in Thessalonica, which we'll head to next week, or the church in Philippi. Those specific stories can reveal a great deal to us about what life was like in those early church communities. And Philippi was quite an impressive city, it sounds like. Um, really established in the 4th century B.C. by King Philip. Um, it quickly became a military and commercial um, stopover on something called the Via Ignatia, which I understand was a, Ro a, a, a Roman-built road um, that basically allowed trade and military movement from Asia into Europe. And if you look at a map, um, it's a pretty straight line uh, coming through Philippi on the eastern edge of Europe from, uh, from both sort of Byzantium and beyond to the, uh, on your way to Asia. So 
supported by this commercial and military value, Philippi became a pretty important city in the scheme of things. Another thing that was different about Philippi from many of the places that Paul and his merry band of evangelists went to is that Philippi did not have much of a Jewish diaspora at all. Unlike so many other cities, large and small, scattered around the Mediterranean and into Europe, where great numbers of Jewish folk had left Jerusalem and the Holy Land and established their communities in synagogues and temples and other places. So almost, you know, I'd say in 90% of the cases when Paul was out there spreading the word of the good news of Jesus Christ and establishing churches, he was doing so by stopping in at a Jewish synagogue when he got to one town or another, or even a bigger city. Philippi just had, I mean, there's no record of any synagogues in Philippi at that time. So Paul was met with a Gentile population of people, which probably made it a very different experience in how the church got going in Philippi. The other thing about our consideration of the church in Philippi is we need to understand that the church did not grow by having Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and scores of others cruising around the countryside with like a team of horses and a wagon with building materials to build churches. They didn't build churches in the first couple of centuries. They went around to a synagogue, to someone's home, to a marketplace, to a, a non-church location like we tend to think about churches. And so I don't know necessarily where exactly Paul might have gathered with people like uh, Syntyche and Euodia and Clement and Epaphroditus, all people who are named by name in this epistle to the Philippians. Um, but it is apparent if one reads the letter to the Philippians closely and then compares it to some of the other epistles that Paul is totally accredited with having written, that there is a special personal relationship that's evident in this letter to the Philippians, especially with some of the words we heard in the passage this morning. My brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. This letter is packed with joy, rejoicing, and be glad. We didn't happen to hear the be glad verb in today's passage, but if you look across the four chapters of Philippians, it's just packed full of joy, rejoicing, being glad. In Paul's other letters, other towns and cities that he visited had more serious problems in their churches. I mean, some of them were, were pretty egregious and sort of outright, I won't say necessarily fisticuffs, but, but people in the churches were really butting heads against one another, and Paul had some serious stuff to try to unpack to try to get those churches back on the right track. Perhaps it's because the church in Philippi was on a good track. Paul is praising his brothers and sisters in that church because they've been reading the gospel, breaking the bread, sharing the wine, really in good Christian community with one another. So perhaps it's because we're hearing about an early Christian church community that was in a really good place that we might find some particularly enheartening examples of Christian church life back at that time. But no reason we can't think about what we might learn from the church in Philippi here on the 19th Sunday after Pentecost in 2020. Because Paul, I realize that a lot of us have fluctuating relationships with Paul. Um, there are those moments when there's no doubt his theology, um, his practical advice about being followers of Jesus is just off the charts untouchable. There are other times when Paul can come across as being a little bit, uh, you know, my, my way or the highway, um, which we happily don't get here in the letter to the Philippians. 
Oh, he does say, keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. But that's pretty low-key by Pauline standards, the way he can oftentimes come across. So let's also appreciate an angle of the relationship of Paul with the church in Philippi. Paul writes this, wrote this epistle in prison. He was in prison. Um, people aren't exactly sure. They, you, you hear references to sort of a Roman military presence, but you can't tell if it's Rome, Caesarea, Ephesus. It could have been any number of Roman prisons. The, the current betting is maybe on Ephesus because it's closer than Rome and, and some of the other possible prisons he might have been imprisoned in. The people of Philippi get knowledge of the fact that Paul, their wonderful Christian compadre, is in prison. They start to pray for him, and then they send Epaphroditus, one of their own, to take gifts to Paul in prison to try to make his life there better. Paul was busy writing away this letter to the Philippians based on some of the things that Epaphroditus told him when he got there. Epaphroditus was taken very ill when he visited Paul in prison to bring him the gifts and to bring the good news of the prayers going on for him. Apparently he was on his deathbed for a short while, so he was there visiting Paul for quite some time. But when Epaphroditus recovered, Paul said to him, Listen, pal, you got to take back to the good people in Philippi so that they might know how much I'm loving them and missing them um, for all the good work that they do. There are just a couple little course corrections I'm going to suggest. I'd love to have it be that if Yodia and Syntyche could just stay focused on the gospel and the things they're doing so well, set aside some of their minor petty differences, you all will continue to do wonderful things as the body of Christ in Philippi. So Epaphroditus brings the letter back and reads it to one and all. Because remember, this, these letters at that time were not written as if I was penning a note to send to our wonderful warden, Bill Galvin, for only his reading. Epaphroditus presumably got back to Philippi, got the church, maybe not all of it, but enough of folks together at whosever home they were probably meeting in, and then read it to them publicly so that they could all hear what Paul had to share with them. And it was wonderful things about joy and rejoicing and the peace of God surpassing all understanding. I mean, this is a feel-good letter, which is great news for the church in Philippi. So, what? Yeah, perhaps if Paul had a particularly amazing talent that he hasn't received quite as much credit as he might have over the years, it would appear that he could really read community dynamics. Because you pick up any epistle accredited to Paul's writing, and you get a real particular specific accounting of what was going on in Corinth or Rome or Galatia or Philippi. And but think about these pandemic times that we're trying to live into. Our normal is out, out in the field somewhere, way far away. It's, it's not coming back anytime soon. We've tried adaptations. We've tried adaptations at 8 a.m. outside. We were working outside this morning. In the middle of my sermon, there's this thump, and a bird had whacked the window of the vestibule and all we saw were a couple feathers floating around. I thought, oh, Lord, let's have a moment of silence for that dear bird. Um, thanks be to God, by the time I finished the sermon, which wasn't that much after his crash, there was the bird on the edge of the vestibule, fluttered his wings and took off. But um, worship outside has been something we've tried. We've started the, uh, the family Eucharist in the parish hall. We'll see if that is another way for people to begin to come together in small groups with or without music. But I wonder if in looking at this letter to the Philippians and thinking about the reality of house churches in the early Christian church, if we're not being spoken to about a possible way, not, you know, hopefully not 
deep into the future, but certainly over these next few months as we try to explore what's going on in our world, both in this parish and in Greenwich and the immediate area. Because we're, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're not a big parish. I mean, we maybe have 60, 70 people worship here on a normal Sunday. So I wonder if we might put together some house churches, some groupings of people, 8, 10, 12 people, to come together here in the parish house, Outside, it, the, the location isn't important. It's the opportunity to try to gather together in a small group setting to have some worship, to perhaps share communion in one kind, and to discuss our way forward as this particular part of the body of Christ that is St. Barnabas Episcopal Church. I wish that our patron saint um, had written more, um, but he was just a good, effective evangelist along with Paul just too darn bad they had a falling out and Barnabas went packing back to Cyprus for the for his golden years which I, I hope were golden while Paul went on with Silas and Timothy and everybody else to establish the early church but perhaps if we focus on what we can learn and model and practice based on Paul's epistles especially this one to the folks in the church in Philippi, perhaps it might speak to us about some things we could try out a little different here at St. Barnabas to try to f see a road map to find our way forward in these pandemic times. Now, this epiphany's come to me just literally over this weekend as I've focused in on this particular passage. Um, I'll leave you all to revisit the parable you all heard in Mark Matthew's Gospel today. I wasn't going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. But the letter to the Philippians, on the other hand, and the other Pauline epistles are something that perhaps we ought to explore more closely together and think about how our Christian community might move into the uncertain future, but do so hearing, hopefully, Paul's faint praise in our ears about his joy for the church, his rejoicing for the church, and urging us to be glad as the body of Christ, even if it means trying out something new and different. Amen.